I'm Lisa Bontesumi, and this is the Ath Mindset podcast series on Sports Epreneur. This podcast series is a space for conversations with athletes, coaches, practitioners, and stakeholders in sports. And it's where those individuals share their perspectives, experiences, and thoughts on mental health in sports. Eric Kazimoff of Sports Epreneur is generously hosting the Ath Mindset podcast series on his platform as he deeply believes that these conversations are essential and deserve to be prioritized. This is the Ath Mindset podcast series on Sports Epreneur. Sports Epreneur, the content platform where sports, entrepreneurship, and mental health collide. If you are looking to start a podcast or create original content, you have to talk with the team at Sports Epreneur. I work with them and I vouch for them. It's that simple. Go to sportse.io to learn more. Today on the Ath Mindset Podcast, we're talking with Damon Wiley, a 23-year-old first-generation Bay Area native, two years removed, UC Berkeley graduate, go Bears. He studied interdisciplinary studies with an emphasis in business, economics development, and history. He also was a part of the Cal rugby team as a four-year starter and three-time All-American. He's also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and has worked closely with 100 Black men in their mentorship division. Welcome, Damon. Yeah. Woo. Hey, I'm juiced today. I appreciate you for having me on. No, I'm excited. I've appreciated, you know, our growing friendship over the months and just being able to, like, talk about everything. And you're an impassioned human, so I appreciate what you bring. So here's my first question. You had said you're two years removed from being a collegiate student athlete. As you reflect, like in this moment right now, what are some of your most fondest memories of your time at Cal? Absolutely. Student athlete wise or just in general? In general, whatever comes to mind. (laughs) Yeah, I've been to a few. Like I said earlier, I'm part of the historical Black fraternity. So crossing was a momentous day for me. We had a little show, so that was momentous for me. I've been to a lot of... Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that a little bit. For those who might not know, what is Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated? What does it stand for? What's the work that you do? What are the principles it was founded upon? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated is found on Ice Cold Tuesday, 7th 4th, 1906. On the campus of Cornell University, by seven men, we refer to as our jewels. These men kind of paved the way um, foundationally for Greek life in general, creating the MPHC and seeing these organizations develop and grow outside of something that we, you know, foundationally created has been not only beautiful, but also refreshing. For us, we stand upon, you know, being men and also just like uplifting and being leaders. Some of our prominent members, Thurgood Marshall, Martin Luther King, Jesse Owens, Frederick Douglass, Cornell West, so on and so forth, right? Something that I think is really amazing about the organization I'm a part of is that everyone serves in a capacity of uh, servant leadership. And so leading from the front and the back, holding the shovel, but also giving the commands, right? So that's something that's very unique. But nonetheless, like all Greek life is amazing, right? From the sororities to the fraternities, we all do similar work. It's all aimed towards like community uplift and making sure that people that look like us have a voice. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about the spiel of like what the organization is on a collegiate tip. I had a really like amazing experience being able to program and we threw a Black Women's Appreciation event where we we brought 500 Black women out. We served them in the community. They gave them like yellow roses, which is our flower. We served them food, catered it all for free. We gave them honorariums and awards. We had a pianist. We had someone that had saxophones. We had a talent show. We have keynote speakers, so on and so forth. And so we do a lot of stuff that's geared towards the community and just a lot of uplift. So it's been a really beautiful experience. And coupling that with my rugby experience, my first two years are pretty rocky and rough. It was a transition for me. I went from a high school that was very much so collaborative and very much so loving to coming into a collegiate space where that wasn't my experience my first two years. My first year was pretty tough. Most of it was, though, I was coming from the football field to the rugby field. So I had never played Uh rugby before and got recruited into 
and to, to play for Cal. And after about my first three to four weeks, I started starting. Right. So I had guys that played rugby their whole lives. I had guys that were fifth year seniors. I had guys that were senior juniors that had been playing on the team, putting a lot of work. They were quite frankly just upset the, the, of the fact that I was even in the running to be a, a potential candidate to be a starter. I remember the day that my name got called, people were just hating on me. It's just like, mm. quite frankly, I was 17 years old, coming 18 because I started school early. And so 17 and a half year old kid coming into mm-hmm. a team I didn't know nothing about and didn't know, how to, didn't know any of the rules, how to play. But I had coaches that believed in me and coaches that invested in me. But I'm forever grateful for it to this day. And that was my experience. Fantastic. Not necessarily, but did I make the most out of it? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for sharing with this broad audience that's listening who and what Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated is, your role in it, the history of it. I think that's really important. We are Greek siblings, (laughs) as I am a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So I know we are brothers and sisters and siblings in humanity and just our growing friendship. But I think that we align in so many ways. As you said, the Greek, historically Black Greek organizations align around the same thing. So we do similar work just within and across fraternities and sororities. So I think that's amazing. I can't lie. Like it hurts my heart a little bit to hear that it was rough, your transition from high school to college that there wasn't as much teammate support. It was a little bit more competitive within, but the coaches are the ones that helped you along there. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't mean to cut you off, but it was really No, go. It's like, so my head coach, right? Coach Jack Clark, a lot of people, the most of the narratives is that he's a tough coach, that he's a tough coach. He's very blunt. He's very straight to the point. He holds you accountable. Right. So a lot of people are like, oh, Damon, when you come in, like, watch out for him. Like, he's going to be blunt with you. I had some of the most harshest, meanest coaches in high school known to man <laughs> that, like, really will set you straight, really will be blunt. So coming in, my expectation, you know, I didn't expect him to be like my high school coaches because, quite frankly, if coaches were like that in high school and weren't getting scholarships, like big time scholarships, then there'd be no reason for them to stay, right? And so uh-huh. when I came in, my head coach, he was really supportive of me. The assistant coach and my position coach, because there was only three, they were all cool to me. The team didn't really mess with me initially because I was different, right? I didn't listen to the same music. I didn't dance the same way. I didn't like to travel to the same place to do the same things. And so me being a freshman guy saying no to upperclassmen that were trying to like get me to do all this stuff and get me to go out to all these places with them they were oppressed, right? And then I'm coupling that with the fact that I was doing well on the rugby field and I had never played before, right? So both of those, we can kind of see why folks felt some type of way. Definitely dealt with some funny business as far as like some of the rhetoric that was displayed onto the, you know, while I was a part of the team. But I honestly think that it was a year problem and not a rugby problem, right? So like, the fifth year seniors to seniors just like wear harsh dues. They kind of shunned you away. And, you know, if you didn't kind of go with the flow or go with the pack. Once those guys left, the team environment and the team compassion, care, and also the hard work of the team and ethic really rise exponentially, which also showed me that huh. having a team that's inclusive and having a team that believes in one another and supports one another actually create a better environment to win, right? Absolutely. We learn about that, but then actually like going through both scenarios, going through one scenario where it's bad team chemistry, but folks are still there to having great team chemistry, thus winning. It was really cool. It was nice to see that. No, I think you make some amazing points that their team chemistry can be developed. It can change when athletes come into a team and when athletes leave. Right. You know, part of my work as a sport performance coach with the Oakland Roots here in the Bay is making sure that the communication is positive, how you relate to each other is positive. Like you think of your teammate before you think of yourself. Like you uplift each other, then yourself. And then in the end, everybody quote unquote wins, right? But like your experience, not everyone's oriented that way. Yeah. So I'm glad that it changed. I know not a lot about rugby. I'm learning. 
But what I do know, and you can confirm for me, is that it's not usually a sport that Black men play, that it is a sport of different cultures and ethnicities, and that, like, what was your experience in that way on the team? It was interesting. I went from, I've had such a melting pot of an experience with sports in general. Growing up, I played football, basketball, baseball. You know, my baseball team, I mostly played with people that were white or Hispanic. My football team was mostly either black or white and Polynesian. And it was interesting coming from De La Salle, my high school. So like my whole team was like a melting pot, but the people who started, like I'm talking about 11 on offense, 11 on defense, most of us were all either Polynesian, Black, now it's pretty much it, right? Mm. Polynesian, Black, and a little drip of like white. So I had a really fantastic experience. I always talk about my high school experience because that was the first time in my life that I'm not going to say race didn't matter, but it was the first time in my life that it was like, all the shit that's happened outside of the world doesn't matter because we got one another. It didn't matter what you look like, where you came from, money, not money, poor, rich. It was mm-hmm. really dope experience. So when I got to Cal, mm. my whole team was white. And so it was really interesting for me to see, like to come to this new space with just purely people that don't look like me, don't come from the same like upbringing as me, don't come from the same background, um, haven't had shared experiences, don't listen to the same music classes, so on and so forth, right? Just everything was just complete opposite. I'm a people person by nature. And so, you know, I'm trying to build rapport, things of that nature. But yeah, it was really difficult for me to find my way. Some of my best friends were actually from our rival school called St. Mary's College in Morocco. Uh Some of my best friends, Polynesian dudes, and another brother, they played on St. Mary's team. And I used to kick it with them a lot. And so... And playing each team and seeing that there may just be either one or none Black men on the team was kind of a trip for me. One experience that I had that I'll never forget, you'll laugh at this one, Lisa, is that there was actually a Sigma that played for UCLA. And he played for UCLA's Uh rugby team. And so Uh when I was a sophomore, he was a senior. And me and him shared this moment before the game. We were about to do a kickoff. I was on one side. He was on another side. And before the game started, I came over to him and I dapped him up in the middle of the field. And I was like, brother, do well today. And we just had a really intimate and cool moment because it was like, we're both three, we're both black, we're both playing a sport where like, we are the onlys pretty much. So yeah, it was really, really interesting. Really, really interesting to say the least. I love that story. Thank you for that. And sort of the dynamic socially, racially, and culturally at De La Salle and then going over to Cal I can imagine there might have been initially a little bit of a a culture shock. You know what I mean? About how to relate, how to connect, how to build a connection that that can translate positively onto the field. Right. Let me ask you, as a De La Salle alum, have you seen When the Game Stands Tall? Absolutely, yeah. So when it was being filmed, it was being filmed while I was at De La Salle. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. That was okay. Dope. So all the videos they have of like that at Dale Sal, that was wild. Like I was lifting in the weight room when they were recording like their stuff that they were recording about Dale Sal. And the movie, the movie was dope because like my running back while I was in high school, the movie was made after his cousin, TK. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it was really cool to like it was cool to see a descendant of somebody, family member that's at the school. I'm playing with them, and then we watch a movie about his experiences. Yes. Yeah, very powerful movie. Very cool to see that be recreated. It's funny. One of my collegiate athletes asked me to watch it so that we could discuss it. Yeah. Like, I was meeting with them. He's like, he's like did you watch it? I'm like, Ugh. He's like, come on now. You better watch it. I'm like, oh, my God. I got to watch it. So I watched it, and I didn't know at the time that it was about De La Salle, which is up the hill from me, basically. But when I watched it, there were a lot of great parts, but I had a lot of critiques, too. So, like, I loved the brotherhood, the passion and personal connection that the main coach had with everyone. When they started talking about, like, you got De La Salle playing the Long Beach team, right? There was a way that 
it was very stereotypically public versus private. And that like the public school, the way it was depicted, the way I saw it was all of the Black students on that team. And that commentators like, they're very physical, they're strong. And that the De La Salle team is much more white, non-Black and brown players later in the film. And that there was never any like, well, they're strong too. It was like, they're more cerebral and thoughtful and tactical. So I was like, hold up, wait a minute. Like, uh uh-oh, it's turning for me. But I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, we see that in our history. It's funny, though, because we have so many, like, a lot of players from our team, Black or white, but specifically Black, they mostly all go to the NFL. It's like very, it's like a trip to me. So like, Maurice Jones, Drew, Amani Toomer, Kevin Simons. You know, it was just like, we have just this long list of just people. Also, a lot of white men, too. I think that, to your point, it makes it very interesting. I mean, in the movie, they made us seem like this, like, dinky little-ass team that was just using straight tactics to, like, win a game. When, like, we don't really preach that. We preach being really gritty and being hella tough. Like, that's the big thing that's taught at De La Salle, like, You guys are not going to be the biggest, strongest, fastest, but you guys will be the toughest, right? Like, if you Uh you break uh your knee, then, okay, you're playing on one leg. Like, it's not like, oh, we're coming out type stuff. So that's the mentality that they ingrain in us when we're over there. And so I always thought that part was very interesting to your point about, like, you know, when Polly came out, they had all these big dudes, all looked like they was from the hood, this and that, which very well might have been the story and narrative, but they didn't need to put a two on a 10, you know? Or a 10 on a two, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. I mean, as you look back at your time, you know, growing up and as a collegiate student athlete, and then kind of fast forwarding to kind of now, what does athlete mental health mean to you now in this day and age and at this time versus like maybe when you were just coming up in college? You know, it's so interesting that you asked that question because I wish I would have been more informed about what it means to be in a healthy mental state. Mm-hmm. Right, you never know what that is, right? And like, you have to be healthy on a multitude of standpoints, right? Spiritually, mentally, physically, mm-hmm. and while you're doing school, right? There's so many different factors and players, and so athletic or sports mental health is something that I found out when I got to college. And what I realized was that when I was in high school and middle school, that there were so many things that were happening, right? Like, for example, if I had a problem at home. I go to the football field. I'm hitting people as hard as I can. If I have a problem at home, if I have an issue at school, see me on a basketball court, right? Apart from that, there's fatigue, right? Brain fatigue, right? There's concussions. There's so many different players and factors. And so for me, when I got to college and I started looking a little bit into sports psychology and seeing like how our minds work, and how they're supposed to work, how they are working, and how they could be working was so interesting for me, right? And then I actually got into real therapy. I'm not saying sports psychology is a real therapy, but I got into like therapy, therapy for like all the trauma I had growing up. And so like coupling that with like my athletic journey, it actually made me realize something interesting. And I don't know if you and I discussed this, Lisa, but it actually made me realize that I didn't really even like sports. And why I say that was because of two things. First thing is, Growing up as like a black boy or like a biracial boy, when I'm watching the television screen, I only see a few things, right? I see a certain demographic, a certain race in one area, and a certain demographic and a certain race in another area. Uh So what the hell would I think if I see people that look like me that are like biracial or black looking at stuff and I'm seeing them as athletes, rappers, or comedians? Right. And then for the, stereotypes. Right. Stereotypes. On my other side, like mm-hmm. being an Asian man too, you know, I see us working in like high up positions in corporate or cooks. I come from a family of chefs. And so I've seen cooks my whole life that look like me. And so my experience growing up was like, well, damn, I got to get in here so I can get a scholarship someday so that it can put me on for school. Once I got to college and I started playing rugby, and it wasn't rugby. It just made me realize like my junior year of rugby was a trip to I, I can't replicate the experience, but I really sat there like it was like my second to last game and we were making it to the championship. And I was like, damn, like I don't even think I like playing sports. I think for most black men in particular, it's an outlet for me to get my aggression out, one, but two, 
parents, uncles, that great uncle, that grandfather, that distant cousin, that best friend, teachers, they all ingrain in us as Black men that if you don't do this, you will not be able to go to college. Mm. And it's such an interesting perspective. If my whole life on the TV screen, I see athletes, I'm being told by everyone around me that you have to do this in order to get to here, then why the hell wouldn't I do it? Why wouldn't I, right? And the biggest thing that's funny to me is a lot of people look at football players as being dumb, as athlete men, particularly Black men being dumb, or just athlete men in general. What I think is so funny about that is if we were able to tell Black men or athletes in general the transferable skills from the rugby field, football field, soccer field, whatever, that's transferable into the workforce and corporate, maybe we'd be able to start changing some minds. That's a conversation people don't want to have, right? Unless they are of the upper echelon, right? It's so interesting to me. Wait a minute, hold up. (laughs) Did I read the bio right? Like, did it say 23 or did I flip it and it actually says 32? (laughs) Like, Damon is dropping some gems right now. Like, I mean, on a serious tip, I'm impressed with the way that you can think and articulate the depth of these dynamics at 23 years old. Right. Thank you. That's, that. No, it's so impressive. These are like very serious and deep and complex concepts you're talking about right here. I owe it to your parents, your community and Alpha for like, shaping the man that you are and who are you becoming. But this is a deep concept that sports, whatever the sport might be, is an outlet or way to cope with life. That I am being put in a situation where I don't have to talk about my feelings or my anger because I get to go express my aggression against another human being and it's glorified. It's encouraged. Yes. And so that is just a whole nother five hours we could talk about that. Then that Black men, Black male athletes, athletes in general are dumb, don't have any (laughs) intellectual capacity to hang with the quote unquote general population. It's that objectification of specifically the Black male in this case as being there to entertain us, being there to produce, perform, and that we don't need to know. We don't want to know anything else about them. Because look out, if we did, like you said, what's that conversation going to be like? Right. I don't know why I'm talking, I'm like dropping and like thinking about all these movies, but the Colin Kaepernick bio docuseries, have you watched any of it? Yeah, absolutely. Damon, I'm thinking about that one episode when he talks about the comparison and equivalency around the combine and the slave auction process. Yeah. You remember what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. How does it feel for you to watch that? I've always talked about like new age slavery and so like what those look like. That looks like the athletic space, particularly though, football and basketball. And then I'm looking on the other tip, jail, right? So like the classroom prison pipeline to, okay, we can't lock them up. Okay, they're very talented. They're very gifted. Okay, now they want us to pay them a lot? Okay, well Uh then, even if we're going to pay them a lot, we're still going to have ownership over them, right? How many Black managers are there? How many Black sports agents are there? How many Black presidents and owners are there, right? I think there's only one Black president. He's a member of my fraternity. And he's a part of the Washington football team. You feel me? So like things like that are so interesting in me. There's a show called Ballers. And it actually shows it's with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He actually is trying to own his own football team. And they will not let him have a seat at the table. And everyone at the table, they all look the same. Huh. Right? And so... Huh. It's always interesting to me because you'll talk to critics and people that are like, oh, well, these people aren't qualified. Oh, this, oh, that, right? There was just an article about the Dolphins head coach talking about some, there's no Black representation. There's no Black head coaches. Where are they, right? And so 
I'm not saying, and for all the people listening to the podcast, I'm not saying the whole world needs to be black. I'm not saying every single head coach in the NFL needs to be black. I'm just saying if there was 26 to 30 coaches and we only have one black coach, what is going on? What you are saying, and it's okay if you were saying that, you know, I want you to be you on here. I don't care. Right. Like, if that's your sentiment, express it. But like, where I'm coming from with it, and I know we share the same view on it, is what the inequitable representation of athletes who play versus the ownership, the leadership, the coaching, like you just said, it's inequitable. Right. And it doesn't represent, like the ownership and coaches are there to support their biggest asset, which is their athletes. If there's no way that they're going to allow people who might look like them or potentially have some lived experience that correlates, there's a disconnect. Right. Right. It makes me think of this picture. So I mentor, you know, but the folks that, you know, obviously that we're you know, speaking to, they don't know, but I mentor Black boys. I teach them emotional intelligence specifically. Actually, I mentor Black boys and Black girls and Black individuals in general yes. about emotional intelligence. And what I teach about is I teach about like, I have this band-aid analogy that all through our life, we get a bunch of cuts, bumps and bruises. People always tell you to tough it out. And so my analogy is, you know, my whole life and most people around me, they all tell us to just put band-aids over these scars, right? You get a cut, put a band-aid on it, put some Neosporin on it, keep it pushing, right? Now, by no means am I saying that life is easy. And by no means am I saying that we should not work hard and push through adversity and difficult times. What I am saying, though, is that we can push through these difficult times, but also we can address them, right? And so my whole thing is, Instead of walking around looking like a mummy with all these band-aids on, we can take them off one by one and heal internally, right? And so these cuts and these bumps and bruises start to actually heal. And so we're still pushing through the adversity, meanwhile, while healing internally, right? And that's a big thing for me. But to your point, Lisa, that really took me is, I'm thinking about this picture that I once saw. So if we can imagine here, there's three people. There's a girl that is nine years old, there is a little girl and she is two years old. And then there's a grown man that's 25 years old. We obviously can envision they all have different heights, right? So when I think about our nation, I think about this. When we speak about equality, if there is a big fence and we give them all three boxes and then the same height, there's only going to be one person that's going to be able to see over the fence and there's going to be another person being able to peek. So the grown man that's 25 will be able to see over the fence. The nine-year-old girl will be peeking just over the fence. The two-year-old girl will not even be able to see, right? That's equality in our country, right? Oh my God, everyone's given the same opportunity, so on and so forth. Now, for me, the big thing that needs to be talked about, and this is part of the reason why Martin Luther King, Malcolm X were killed, is they talked about economic equality. Uh And when we start talking about the dollar and the circulation of the Black dollar in particular, people start getting real iffy about that stuff. And so the picture for me, you know, if we can envision it again, is we have this 25-year-old man standing still, we have this nine-year-old girl standing on one box, and we have the two-year-old girl standing on three boxes. And now all three of them are eye level, right? And that's what I'm pushing for. And so when we talk about football, basketball, our school system, because our education system is trash, when we speak about our prison to pipeline, to jail pipeline, right? All of these things, a big problem is we don't have equity. And so if we don't have equity, we won't really be able to see quality, uh-uh. right? And that's just facts to me. Uh-huh. Thank you for breaking that down. I love the image, the picture, how you break it down for your mentees in that way. The Band-Aid, walking around looking like a mummy. We don't want that. I think the biggest takeaway for me in what you were just saying is economics. I mean, that's when it becomes power dynamic that we don't want to, if we take, go back to the football analogy, the athletes to have equitable or even near equitable power in their own sort of life decisions, their own well-being. Let that be only to the coaches. But it's just upsetting when, again, going back to Colin Kaepernick, that the way that it's the same people in the same positions for the combine and then the larger 
sport NFL industry, and then the slave auction process that the white men are measuring bodies, are evaluating, are putting value to someone's physical ability by their arm span, their length, how tall they are, how much they weigh, like touching and prodding. It's such an intrusive process, but the athletes themselves are used to it. They know this is what to expect. This is what we have to do, but it's just so deep that it mimics the buying and selling of slaves under the same criteria, the money on both sides. It's interesting to your point too, because it shows how numb we are, right? Yeah. And it's like, we're numb to stuff that we are unconscious about. Mm -hmm. I bet you a lot of student athletes, and I even know myself, like, I've been to a combine before. I'm numb to the fact that I'm going through all of these tests. Like, really, I think about it. If you see me on a field playing football and you see me chase down one of the fastest players in high school or college, do you need to see me run a 40? Do you need to see me do a shuttle? You know? Like, if you see me playing defensive line or linebacker and I smack the hell out of a 6'7", 380 pound dude. Do you need to see me do bench press a million times? Do you need to see how high I can jump? Right? Like all of these different criteria are so interesting to me, but it's a way to replicate. And I think to your point, Lisa, that the stuff that we're talking about, a lot of people do not want to talk about, right? It makes folks very, very uncomfortable. It doesn't make us feel uncomfortable. It makes folks feel very uncomfortable. And, you know, one of my profiles and like alumni guys once told me that if Things that people say make you feel uncomfortable, the nine times out of 10, it's true, right? And so if I'm saying these and these are accusations towards you, if you feel some type of way, that means that there's some truth to it. And it's just very interesting to me, just that whole experience. Colin really broke it down big too. Oh my God. He talked about it. And I wish he would have spoke more about how we tear against each other too, right? So we go through this like extensive process to like be vetted and be selected right? Into the like draft. Yep. And once we get there, we're pinned against each other, right? And back to the right. days of slavery with the Mandingo fights. Yes. Right? For folks that don't know about Mandingo fights, slave owners used to bring black male slaves into a room and say, fight to the death. Whoever wins gets to leave. And so not only were we getting our family stripped apart from us, we we're actually fighting to the death, which in turn turned us against each other innately. Yes. And that's sometimes, I mean, if we were to take it full circle, back to the experience on a team. You know, you're fighting each other for the position. You're fighting for each other for that notoriety, that acknowledgement, that glorification, whatever. It's because it goes without critique, without inquiry. Right. It's just expected. And I think, I'm not saying, I don't think you are too, that we can't have good sport industries that compete, that highlight the abilities of athletes, but like, don't let it just be that. Allow us to know them as humans. Allow them to share with us that they're humans. But again, it's the, shall I say, I don't know, brainwashing of the fans that don't care. Yeah, psychological warfare. I mean, it's been happening. I mean, it happens everywhere we go. It happens on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all the mass media spaces. It happens in every single sports team that we're a part of. It happens in the classroom, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I really need people to wake the hell up. Like, we've been getting manipulated since the beginning of time, since slavery ended, and people are, like, really turned off to it. We get manipulated through our music every day, right? We have different types of music, ergo, why there's a different type of generation, right? Good or bad, whatever that means, right? Yep. I think it's just funny to see the people that put these stipulations in place to distract us. Because if they continue to keep distracting us, then we're never going to push for progress. Exactly. Right? We can have every Black woman, Black man in being a senator, mayor. It still doesn't matter if the majority of us are not judges. Right? And so, yeah, those are just some of my thoughts. (laughs) So, again, we could talk for hours on end. I hope we get that chance to continue. One other thing that you brought up was sort of sports psychologists and then quote unquote real therapy. I think that's important to like take some time with. In the sports psychology experience, they talked with you or that people or person talked with you about performance on the field. Right. 
Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I didn't mean to say, just scratch that. I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say that I didn't know that there were so many different forms of therapy. Yes. And I know you didn't take it offensively. I'm just like, to make the record straight, therapy, when I think about it, I think there's one space for trauma and pain and all of the broken hearts and wounds. And I think there is therapy for actually sports, collisions, experiences, like mental health. I see those two as divided when they ultimately, they can be together. Yes. And so I just want to clear that up. No, no. I think it's super important because what you're highlighting is a general misunderstanding. And conversations like this, I want to be able to leave some food for thought and some information that can help people make decisions. So sports psychologists are trained to deal with like performance anxiety, team cohesion, bonding. They use tools like imagery, positive self-statements, process goals to develop mental skills like motivation, confidence, things like that. That's their realm. And it is what they do. A clinical sports psychologist can also deal with what I just named, but also the clinical aspect of them as a human. So the traumas, the experiences that they might have on the field as well, like with teammates and relationships, but also in life, spouses, partners, family members, things like that. So a clinical sports psychologist can do both. Myself, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I have been for 21 years. It wasn't until recently where I pivoted to work with athletes and I was like, hold up, do I want to do mental health like I've been doing? That's cool, yes. Do I want to also do the sport performance side and treat it holistically and address both? And I was like, yes. You know, the answer when we self-inquiry might not be yes as a professional. But then I went back, I had the nerve, Damon, to go back to school, take some coursework, go through the whole process of becoming a certified mental performance consultant, which I'm one exam away from, to be able to do both. Do you have to have that CMPC to do sport performance? No. It is, though, the gold standard. You know, it is something one would look for if you want a sport performance specialist who's not a sports psychologist. So knowing what you need as an athlete and knowing where to go. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, for me, it's important to be able to offer both because for me, it would be harder to like split it up. I'm not wired like that. So I just, I want to learn the most I can to be able to do both. Right. So that's for anybody out there who wonders. And like, Damon, you brought up a great point that I wanted to just kind of go a little deeper with so people aren't confused or at least have a little bit more information. Right. So ah, we're talking about some stuff though. Currently, as a young man, a professional person working at LinkedIn right now as a global sales associate and being a part of a prestigious program called the Business Leadership Program. I mean, you are now not a collegiate athlete. What was that transition for you like from being a collegiate athlete into the workforce? Oh, it's been beautiful. Like I told you early on, I realized my junior year that I didn't really like playing sports like that. Mm -hmm. I think it was the team camaraderie and having the concept of like having a lot of brothers and friends. But I realized a lot of the reason why I liked playing it was because I needed an outlet, right? And so how was the transition for me? I did something that most people don't because most people are not informed this way. And so what I did was I actually got an internship all four years of college. Mm studied hard, and I joined a bunch of organizations. So when it came time for me to graduate or for my senior year, I was having people knocking on my door talking about, we need you, Damon. We want you. Come on, come work for us, right? And so I did service with that. I think part of that, those two things, right? So football players, for example, Cal, use them. They have summer workouts. Lisa, can they ever get summer internships? Right. No. 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 It's impossible, right? Our soccer players, our baseball team, whatever, all these athletes. Yep. Can anyone get summer internships? No. Uh Right? And people say summer is the most important part. Three to three and a half months of just hardcore work can be a game changer. Is it true? Yes. Is there season in the fall? Yes. Are some seasons in the spring? Yes. But are we setting these young men up for success? I don't know the answer to that question. 
right? I can only speak about my own experience. When I came into college, I'm first generation college student. And so my family didn't know the advice to give me as far as do this, do that, join this, join that, do this major, do that major, right? They only told me work as hard as you can Uh and do what's going to help you get to the next level, right? And so I didn't get the whole narrative of what most parents say to kids or what most caregivers or guardians say, which is figure it out. I didn't have that experience. I had someone say like, hey, you need to get it in while you can in college, make the most out of the experience so you get a fantastic job. That's exactly what I did. And the kids that I mentor, I tell them, we don't have time to do that, figure that out stuff. We need to have vision. And whatever your vision is, let's go get it. And just understand that there's a way to get to the money, but we have to be tactful about it. Yes. So that's kind of like my sentiments as far as that being like a young man out of college. I think I really set myself up in a way to be extremely successful, not only networking, but also making my resume look sexy. To, right. to, use, to use that term, you know what I'm saying? So, yes, that's really all I can say about that. Well, it's a lot. It's a lot you have just said about that. I mean, so for those who are curious, how did you fit in the time and energy to be involved in all these organizations and do these internships while you were an athlete and a college student? Oh, Lisa, you know the answer to that. <laughs> you got to make time where you can. I mean, sometimes you don't have a choice. I learned that easy and hard way, right? Sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you got to get it in. I had friends who had kids during college. I had other friends that had all the money in the world, right? Either way, it didn't really matter. It's about kind of your work ethic and what you wanted. For me, that whole concept of that Eric Thomas talks about is like, or if you want to breathe as hard as you want to succeed, then you'll be successful. And that was really my mentality. It was like, I'm fine. I was a part of four organizations and I had my fraternity. So I was part of four organizations, my fraternity, studying school, and I played rugby, right? And I was a family man and I had a really awesome social life, right? So like, I did all these things because in my head, I'm thinking to myself, four years is nothing, right? In my generation, this millennial generation, Gen Z, Gen X, whatever, Uh Instant gratification, constant gratification is something so difficult, right? Immediate like winnings and immediate turnover is difficult for us to even digest. And so for me, my whole thought process is if I work my butt off for four years and I'm rich for the rest of my life, do the four years really even matter in the grand scheme of things? Absolutely not, right? And I took that in my personal life too. Where I'm at in LinkedIn, is this where I want to be my whole life? Absolutely not. But is it a step to get me to where I want to go? Yeah. Right? So that's kind of my thoughts about that. No, again, lots of gems being dropped right about now. I mean, what you're talking about is prioritizing your time, not just managing. Managing is moving here, moving stuff there, moving there. Da, da, da. But there are so many things in a day, in a week that need to be done, especially in the life that you created for yourself at Cal, that you have to prioritize things knowing that some things aren't going to get done that week or that day, but need to be pushed over and that the next day or next week might have a different priority. Yep. So that's key. That is key. I do want to comment on another place that we both are aligned with is being a mixed race. Both of us having parents of different races and cultures. So my dad is white. He's first-gen college student. My mom's an immigrant from the Philippines. They met in graduate school here in Berkeley. And they each have their own set of intergenerational traumas that come from their upbringing. My mom survived in war. My dad's dad was a foster kid. You know, there's so many things that there's a a way that they didn't even know how to embody their own experience, much less connect with one another to the point where we are aligned in parenting. And that there was a way that I didn't feel fully seen, like loved and accepted at certain parts of my life where that was crucial for me to like basically survive, I felt. And that I needed to find where's the love. I think I deserve it. I want it. At a time in my life, it was Black people, the Black culture, the Black community that I was a part of in college 
in, in the town of Santa Barbara outside of my college that saw me, that welcomed me, that like, I don't care, like, you're you. Like, they saw me in a way that my own Filipino people and white people couldn't and didn't. And so that's where my heart is. Like, my heart will always be a part of my own lived Black experience with other people. I'm not biologically Black, but that is a community and group of people that I will always give to. And it's an interesting dynamic. And now I can say, you know, I'm a proud multiracial woman who embodies and celebrates all aspects of myself. But at the time, it was Delta who like saved me. It was Delta who loved me. I mean, I could go on and on. But I think that's an interesting part of our stories too that we haven't touched on. Is there anything that you want to share about your experience and yeah, how absolutely. you identify, you really talk about it, things like that? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, for folks that don't know on the call, I'm a Black half Thai, I'm proudly Thai, proudly Black. It was a different experience to me overall, though, because I didn't grow up with both my parents. I grew up with my uncle and my grandparents. So I give you guys a timeline. So from about one to five, I was living with my mother and then I got adopted and my grandfather, grandmother, and uncle on my mom's side, they all became my guardians. I had never met my dad before in my entire life, right? Mm. I knew nothing about his family, anything of that nature. So knowing that I'm Black, but being raised Asian until I get to middle school, or until I pretty much until I got to high school to learn a little bit more about Black culture, then I get to college and I'm learning more and more, right? The only sense of like mm. Black culture I could learn was through movies and mass media, right? Ergo, why my perception or stereotypes of Black people were because of that when I was growing up until I got awakened once I, to your point, once I joined Alpha, a lot of like stereotypes and questions were being asked that I had never thought of, which made me in turn Mm -hmm. think deeper and deeper into that experience, right? But yeah, being multiracial has been a huge difficulty for me. I grew up in Antioch for half my life. And then I grew up in Saramon. So I went from a community that was all black to a community that was all white in the flip of a switch, right? From six to 11, I was in Antioch. From 11 to 17, I was in San Ramon. And then like San Ramon and Pleasanton going back and forth between my grandma's house and my uncle's house. And then ultimately I landed at Berkeley. So then I moved to Berkeley. I was there for five years. And then I moved around a little bit. My family's house is from Panola to Martinez and landed my spot in Concord, right? So I've been all over the Bay. I say that to say, being biracial, being Black, being Asian, being raised Asian, I speak Thai, I can understand Thai. I know all about the cultural background, all the traditions, been to the temple and Buddhist, all this good stuff. Man, I can't really describe it. it. It's been one of the most amazing experiences for me. And to your point, Lisa, it's like when I was with my mom and, you know, being raised by her for a few years, there was something missing, right? And once I got brought in by my family, my uncle, he raised me at 17 years old. He gave me a lot of structure. And then the woman that I call mom, I met her when I was nine, right? Like it brings me to tears when I talk about my experience, not because I'm saddened, but because I'm so proud, happy, and grateful for these people that came into my life, right? The whole concept of it takes a village to raise somebody. I have a village that shielded me, guarded me, and protected me from all the bad stuff that could be happening around me, right? Some of my best friends are rappers. Some of them are drug dealers. Some of them kill folks. Some of them are in jail. Some of them are dead, right? That all those spaces and places, they could have very well shown been me. And so- To be at the position that I'm at now, part of the reason why I've invested into the youth, part of the reason why I'm on the podcast with you, part of the reason why I sit on a bunch of panels for LinkedIn as well is because of authenticity, but also sharing my story is going to allow me to not only heal internally, but also to help others heal that go through a similar experience, right? How many of us don't grow up with parents, but then we go down the wrong path? We get loved by the gangs. We get loved by those brothers. We get jumped in by them. How many of us do that? How many of us make stupid decisions because we're not emotionally competent or emotionally sound and happy within ourselves so we make bad decisions, right? If me and you went to go visit a jail cell right now, how many brothers and sisters would be up in there saying, I just made one bad decision. I just made one wrong thing, one this, one that. Now I'm in here for life, right? So those are my thoughts about that. 
No, again, we could go on for hours just about that topic. I really appreciate your openness and your willingness to share your story, your upbringing. It makes more sense to me now. How come you're like wise behind your years? You had all these amazing people in your life guarding you, like shaping you, loving you. It's really a beautiful story. I was going to say one more thing, Lisa. I don't mean to cut you off. No, Uh, not at all. A lot of the love that I got given to me too, you know, to have my uncle who was extremely like wise, but also very strict and to like implement structure and like really roll with iron fist, to have a grandmother that was so sweet. And there's three people that I'm going to talk about, but each one of these people really taught me a lot and really shaped me as a young man. And I'll be very brief about it because I didn't say it earlier, but my uncle, he really ruled with iron fist, but also was very loving, right? So said love you all the time. Didn't necessarily say any other compliments outside of that, but always said love you and appreciate you. He never received that growing up. Mm. His childhood, you know, his parents, my grandparents were quite distant because they were working all the time, right? Yeah. Immigrants that came here from Thailand. Yes. His experience was very different from mine than what he tried to do for me and raise me. And, you know, my grandmother, she always has this sweet aura about her where she'll do anything for you, even if she's mad, right? She's four foot 11, Thai woman that's hilarious, right? And like, she has this huge heart where she's open, she'll cook for the whole family. She loves to love and she loves everyone around, right? Then what could you expect as an old woman? And then thirdly, someone that impacted my life exponentially was the woman that I call mom. Her name is Marlene. She flipped my life upside down because you know, Lisa, because you have two kids, the love that you have for your child and when your child feels love, it's a different feeling, Uh, right? A different uh experience. And so Uh for me, I got taken in. I met a young man who's a year younger than me that I call my little brother. His name is Tat. When I was nine years old, we played football in San Ramon for our first time. First time I was out there, he was from Concord. I was from Antioch. We were on this team. He lived in Concord, but he was playing in San Ramon with me. We instantly hit it off. We became best friends, really good buddies. His mom became this influential like chess piece in my like career and also my mental health and also just like upbringing as a young man. She taught me a lot of stuff about me that I had never thought about or even would consider, right? And so her, my uncle and my grandmother, they are the big three that really shaped me into the young man that I am to this day. And I can't be more gracious for them. Um, I'm kind of tearing up. Oh my gosh. I love it. And I just love the way you speak about it. It's so heartfelt and true. And if they were listening, you wanted to say something to them, either in Thai or English, what would you like to say to them along the lines of what you just shared? What would you like to communicate to them? Yeah, I mean, I'm big on affirmation, so they already know this. But if I was to say it to them again, I mean, my uncle... I always tell him, you know, he's been my rock since day one. And I learned a lot from him as a young man, business wise as well. And just being a go getter and work ethic, understanding that, you know, in order for us to live in a capitalistic society, that we have to work, we have to get money. And I always appreciate him for pushing the needle forward and continuing to not only invest in like my future and like my success, but also always being there every step of the way, right? Like, if I have a problem, call him, right? And like, always being that problem solver for me. I really appreciate that. For my grandmother, she also taught me work ethic too, the nth degree. I see my grandma open up a restaurant, cook all the meals, serve all the meals, be at the cash registers, taking all of the orders and getting the money transferred and being the dishwasher all in the same breath. I've gotten to see work ethic to a different degree. And one experience that I can share with my grandma that I'm so grateful that I talked to her about today, you know, when I was 11 years old, I kept telling her, she'd come home and be like, grandma, I need money. Grandma, I need money. I want to go buy this, buy that. She goes, I'm going to take you to my job and you're going to be a dish boy for a day and you'll be able to raise $100, right? I'm 11 years old. Of course, that sounds like good money. I'm like, whoo, I'm going to buy hella stuff with this. So (laughs) I actually learned work ethic from that experience though, because I was like, this is something I never want to do in my entire life right? Like this is something I never want to experience, which is manual labor 24-7 for a full day, nonstop. And so I really appreciate my grandma 
for always teaching me that and just for always continuing to give me love and humor and just being a goofy person. And my mom, she's been that person for me since I met her. It's been an instant connection, almost like it was God given. Like, you know, she always talks about, you know, I didn't have you, but if I was to have a son, he would be you. And we always talk about it all the time. She's a person that I always rely on for everything. And so I, you know, I appreciate her. I love her. And she continues to impact me in ways that she knows, but also doesn't know, right? She's a very humble lady too. So when I speak highly of her, you know, she's like, come on now. You yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's get out of here with that stuff. So right. you know, a lot of love to all of them. They're very impactful, very loving, and couldn't be where I'm at without them. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful way to, to end our conversation for now. I appreciate you being on here with me and just sharing from your heart and being so open. And I look forward to many more. Yeah, I appreciate you, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, If y'all not listening to this podcast, I don't know what y'all doing, but I look forward to uh, the many more conversations and our relationship continuing to be nurtured and grow. One of my favorite things about our Sports Epreneur content platform is the opportunity to chat with amazing people in and around the world of sports. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you want to connect more, hit us up on Instagram at Sports Epreneur. Thank you for listening to this Cad Source production, the Sports Epreneur podcast, the podcast where sports and entrepreneurship collide. Sports Epreneur is a content platform, a collaborative team, and a marketing brand that is all about showcasing leaders and difference makers in and around the world of sports. While we create our own content, we also create content with you. This includes collaborative content and exclusive content for your brand. Think podcast, blog, social media, and overall content strategy. Our sports content marketing team is specifically niche for those in the sports industry. That includes sports businesses, athletes, managers, coaches, trainers, entrepreneurs, and business leaders in the sports market. The bottom line is we want to help with your sports-related brand, your content marketing, and your story. Connect with us on Instagram at sportsepreneur or find us online at sportsepreneur.com. Sportsepreneur, the content platform where sports and entrepreneurship collide.